welcome everybody uh, for being with us tonight. Uh, welcome to our master class, four regions, one grape, tempranillo, as part of Spanish Wine Week with Amdena Alberca. Uh, so, yeah, she's, as you all know, a master of wine based in Spain. And uh, so we've been, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that we were celebrating the Spanish Wine Week uh, all week this week with last of events happening in Ireland. So this is the fifth year of the Spanish Wine Week um, in Ireland. So our big thanks to the Spanish Embassy in uh, Dublin. So they've been organizing and supporting the Spanish Wine Week. So thanks to everybody who um, who organized this. And for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Sevgi and I run a company called A Wine Idea based in Ireland. So I organize wine tastings and provide uh, wine education. So as I mentioned that Almudena is a master of wine, but she's the first woman master of wine in Spain. So she became a master of wine in 2018 and as well she has a degree in analogy and viticulture and she has been working as a winemaker in lots of different countries uh, and still working as a winemaker and he's she's a technical director of Vinya Mayor. So I'm going to um, hand over to you Amjana and uh, let you maybe a little bit more um, tell us a bit more about you so thank you so much again uh, for being with us tonight. Um, over to you, please. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here with you. So thank you very much for thinking of me for this presentation. It's a pleasure and an honor. Um, I think you make a very short and great introduction of me. I'm working with uh, related with wineries in enology and viticulture since the last uh, 17 years. Um, I was working in New Zealand for a harvest and I was traveling all around as much as I could until now. <laughs> but I don't travel anywhere um, due to the, this COVID situation. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was um, doing my Master One studies uh, while I was uh, developing my career as an enology, uh, enologist or one maker in, in Spain. Um, so, first of all, I was working in a small wineries producing boutique wines of high quality uh, level. And five years ago, I moved to Viña Mayor, and now I'm running the, the four wineries that belong to the group uh, in Rioja, Rivera, Rueda, and Toro. And we have a couple of small projects in the northwest uh, of Spain, in Rías Baisas and Valdeorras. So, pretty, pretty busy. <laughs> All around Spain, really, you are making wine. That's that's so impressive. Yeah, and I love it. It's my passion, and I really love this this profession. So, really happy because I don't need to uh, worry about working because uh, I'm having fun. <laughs> yeah, and, and you must have a very busy uh, busy schedule at the moment uh, to harvest and everything. So. Yeah, this year everything came very early compared with other years, uh, which is true is that we had a very rainy uh, spring with moderate temperatures. The summer was uh, a combination between very high temperatures and very warm summer, but combined with storms and a lot of rain. So suddenly uh, everything happens very early, even in in all in River in El Duero. For me, it's the earliest year that I ever had in Rivera del Duero. Oh. Um, so we started the 23rd of September, and it, it was because it was raining. But it was uh, a lot of wineries like Pingus. Yeah. Uh, they started the 10th or the 12th of September, which is very unusual. Okay. Almost one a month earlier than other years. Wow, so that's... Okay. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. And for, for instance, we were picking in Rivera del Duero uh, in all the dios at the same time, Rioja, Rivera, Rueda and Toro, which normally mm, never happened. Norm 
Sainz, after that you go to Toro, Rioja. And for a week, we were picking everywhere. So um, this is why I'm a little bit tired at the moment, but... <laughs> uh, I can imagine, yeah, harvest time is always the busiest time of the year for winemakers. So, but once it's finished, um, kind of like have I think big um, you know uh, happiness and uh, relaxation afterwards so that's that's a good feeling I think after yeah. finishing the harvest so that's that's very nice so um, should we should we start yeah yeah I'm really looking forward to it okay so um, basically I was speaking a lot and I didn't tell you hello to everyone uh, really nice to have you uh, here and thank you very much for joining and I hope that you all of, all of you are very well and very safe and enjoying Spanish wines which I think is a incredible opportunity for us to show up uh, the diversity and the great wines that we have in our country so thank you very much again let's go for it I'm going to um, to make a small introduction to Spanish Please. wines I like to do that in order to put in context uh, what means Spain and what Spain can offer. And after that, we are going to go through um, through the wines, talking about the variety and looking uh, how the each wine is different due to the different climate, soil, and situation or location in Spain. Yeah. So a couple of few big numbers. I don't want you to get bored, but I think it's really interesting, you are going to learn a bit. So basically here we have data uh, about the, um, the, the plantations or the surface that are planted around the world. We can see that Spain is the uh, biggest country with the biggest uh, surface planted in vineyards, followed by China and very close of France and Italy. Uh, China is in the second, in the second place, but uh, we know that in China there are a lot of uh, table grapes mm. that are included inside the surface or planted in the country. So we don't know exactly um, how many hectares uh, really dedicated to the one making uh, they will have. So, but they have a big amount. Yeah. And if we talk about hectoliters uh, produced by country, Spain comes to the third place. Italy is the first country, France is the second country, and Spain is the third. Why is that? Because uh, in Spain, the majority of the vineyards are planted without irrigation, uh, planted in bush vines. So the density is uh, smaller, so the uh, kilos or gills per hectare are lower than in the neighbor countries as France or Italy. So we think about Bordeaux, we will be finding even in the top chateaus, we will be finding 10,000 plants per hectare, while in Spain, uh, in the um, best situation or in the best uh, case scenario, maybe we will be finding 4,000 maximum. So this is it's less different. than a half. And normally without irrigation, so we are going to have less yields. We need to have this into account. Um, if we see the total production around the world, this, this is big numbers, not only about Spain, but this is the total production and the total consumption around the world. We can see that there are big variations between the years and depending on that, because the consumption is very similar through the years, depending on that, we will be having a more balance or less balance around the uh, globe. But and if we see about the major countries, about uh, the countries that consume more wine, we can see that this US, France, Italy, Germany, as you can see there, um, and Ireland is, uh, I don't remember what was the, the place, but it was a little bit below in the list, but with yeah, a yeah. relatively <laughs> good amount for the, uh, <laughs> for the country. Yeah. Um, Thinking on that, uh, what, what is Spain within these big numbers? So Spain is the biggest exporter in the world with around 20 million of hectoliters. And, uh, wait a second, I want to move this. Uh, 
and uh, normally is exporting around 55% of our production. Spain has a, a global market share of 20% and it's a total value of around 9% or 10% of the big picture of the world. Yeah, yeah, that's that. <laughs> What do we have in Spain? So Spain is a country where we can find a um, lot of small DOs and 67 plus 2 DOCA. Um, so it's a country uh, where we can find a lot of diversity. Diversity of climates, diversity of soils, a uh, lot of rivers. So the country is full of rivers and mountains, which is basically dividing the countries. And this is why we can find even different languages, different cultures and different gastronomy. All of this is related with lots of different varieties and this uh, greatness that we can find in Spain and what we, uh, the people from the uh, wine business or the ones that we are wine lovers, we love about the countries that we can find so many different things. So if we see, if we look to Spain um, in the world, we can see that it's a peninsula uh, which is uh, surrounded by ocean and by a sea, which each of them is going to create a different uh, climate in the area. So all of this is going to impact as well. And also is in the southern part of the North Hemisphere. That's meaning that we are going to have a relatively warm climate, particularly in the south. So if we look to the geography um, in Spain, um, we can see that this is a beautiful map that I love because it reminds me when I was a child. Uh, <laughs> but I think we need to go to the roots in order to understand uh, well Spain. So in the center of Spain, we have Madrid. Madrid, uh, everyone that uh, has been in Madrid for once, at least flying or going out of Madrid, Madrid is like a little plateau surrounded by high elevation mountains, around 2,000 meters altitude. Um, all of this is the Sistema Central and Sistema Ibérico that you can see there in the center. But basically, Spain has two big plateaus, which is uh, Castilla y León and Castilla-La Mancha, which are flat in the middle and they are surrounded by high uh, elevation mountains. These plateaus, even being flat, we can find very high elevation as well. The flat flat part will be around 700 or between 700 and 800 meters altitude, which is going to impact directly into the climate. So we have in, inside very strong continental climate with very low temperatures during the winter. Uh, we can have normally or regularly minus 10, minus 5 degrees. Even this week, we have two days with minus 2 in the morning. Wow, okay, yeah. And it's relatively soon in the in the autumn season. Yeah. And in during the summer we have very high temperatures and normally dry. High temperatures of 35 or between 35 and 40 degrees. So there are big variations between the day and the night. If we cross the mountains, for example, in the north or northwest of Spain, we we see that we have high elevations, but after that we are going to have an impact of the uh, Cantabric Sea, which is part of the Atlantic Ocean. And we got, if we look to the northwest in Galicia area where Rias Baisas is, we are going to have all the impact of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. If we go to the east, uh, we have the Mediterranean uh, Sea, which is going to impact as well in all the sea coast in Spain, giving us a lot of diversity as well. And we have the southern part with big variation as well, with high elevations, like with, if you have been in Granada, for example, in Granada you have the beach, you have the, you can go for skiing uh, during the winter, and you have a warm, nice temperatures coming from the south part yeah. of yeah. Spain. And even if we look to the, where more or less Seville is, in, on top of Cadiz, in the bottom part, um, there we have uh, mountains where you can have the highest uh, raining, um, the highest amount of rain 
during the year. There are a couple of spots where you can have more than 1,000 millimeters per year. So all of this is speaking about a big diversity. And also, all the peninsula Iberica is divided by the big rivers. The Duero River, which is going into Portugal, the Duero Ebro from Rioja to the Mediterranean Sea, um, the Tajo, the Júcar, the Segura, all of this is going to change as well soils and climate. Yeah. And we didn't speak about the volcanic islands of uh, Canary Island and the Mediterranean uh, islands of uh, Baleares, which have completely different climate as well. So this will be a simple map of the climate. So we have a maritime climate or ocean climate in the northwest of Spain, followed by a mountain climate with very high elevations here, more than 2,000 meters, and where we can find as well some vineyards. Continental in the majority of the inland of Spain. Mediterranean, obviously, in the east and in the south. And we can find very arid spots or desert uh, climate in the bottom part, in the east, uh, southeastern part of Spain, where we can find beautiful areas in like Jumilla or other where we can find very beautiful wines from different varieties, not the one that we are going to see today. <laughs> Um, so this is a small uh, thing about the Canary Island. Obviously, they are in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and they are, they have a volcanic um, uh, soils and influence, and as well, it's very close to the Ecuador. So the con the climate there is tropical climate. Said that, with all this diversity that we have in Spain, the king of the varieties from our country is Tempranillo. Uh, but it seems that maybe all the wines in Spain are made out of Tempranillo because we have Tempranillo planted all around Spain. But Tempranillo is one of these interesting varieties that is uh, able to give us different profiles depending where it is uh, based, the soil, the climate, and uh, how you uh, work with it. So this is why maybe we can call it the, the variety with 1,000 faces because we can find many different styles out of it. Exactly. Yeah. So to learn a bit, a bit uh, about Tempranillo, um, uh, I call it here that is the hero grape of, of Spain. Um, and also, I, I said before that 1,000 faces, maybe, and also 100 names at least. That's because scary. <laughs> in, each, uh, in each area of Spain, um, the Tempranillo takes a different name. So Tinto Fino, for example, in Ribera del Duero, Tinta de Toro, in Toro Area, Tinto del País, in so many places, Tencibel, in La Mancha, Ul del Llebre, in uh, Catalonia. But what this mean, or why it has different names? Of course, if you look to the DNA, it's going to be the same variety, but I think all of these names are showing that the variety has totally different profile in this area compared to another area. And I think it's a way of giving this personality to the variety. Yeah, I think if you go to Portugal as well, it has different names over there too. Terroris, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's even more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 totally agree. So, in the world, we can find 231,000 hectares of Tempranillo, which 88% is in Spain. And it's a variety that has been traveled around the world, especially in Portugal, because we are neighbors and we are part of the Iberian Peninsula. So, we are very close together, so we share so many things, although we have different personalities, mm -hmm. like many different parts of Spain as well. Um, so we can find as well that the variety has been traveled to Italy, US, especially in California, Oregon, Washington, and Texas, Mexico, Argentina, Australia, and small spots in New Zealand. Very small, I think it's like seven or 10 hectares, but they are producing very, very good quality. So maybe it becomes more interesting, which is true that a part of Portugal and Spain, and I think as well Texas, 
uh, is a minor variety in other countries. It's not like, for example, yeah. Cabernet Sauvignon, which is no. it's always a big variety in every country, having an international profile and personality. But in the, in, in the case of Tempranillo, it's more strong in Portugal and Spain. Um, so this is just for visual um, memory or for the people who, who which has more visual uh, spots. So we can find here the colors where the we can find the Tempranillo around the world, which makes me very happy. Um, so um, how is the Tempranillo variety in the field? Talking about viticulture uh, characteristics, let's say. Um, is a, the name Tempranillo, if we take Temprano, making a short word, Temprano is like sooner or soon okay. in, in Spain. So the name is suggesting that the variety ripens early, which is true. It's, it's not only a suggestion, it's a reality. And as well has an early budding. This is why sometimes it has a risk of frost, uh, particularly in the spring, or when we go into the very extreme climates, like is Rivera del Duero, which is very strong continental climate, we have a lot of risk of frost uh, in spring, but as well in, in autumn, like I told you now. This year, everything happens very early, and we were picking two weeks before average date of the years. But if we think that normally nowadays we should be picking or a regular year we will be picking now and we already uh, we are in the 17th of October and already we have I think uh, four or five days with uh, temperatures below zero. Okay. So in a normal year when you need to ripe properly the tannins and the seeds and the skin is a problem because sometimes you don't have time to finish the ripening season as you want as being a one maker. So it's a variety which it can be relatively fertile depending on the soils where it is grown. It's sensitive to wind and to drought, although it can uh, support well the drought or drought situations, but particularly when the summer is too hot and we don't have enough water, uh, the plant closed down and stop the, the ripening of the tannins and the seeds, which is the most important thing for make wines with a lot of aging potential. And it's susceptible to powdery mildew, which is, I think, general, uh, general for a lot of varieties. And it has so many other things. This is just in general. In a way, it's easy to, to grow. It's not very complicated. Um, if we think about the history where the Tempranillo started, uh, there are several ideas. I was uh, reading with very, um, I was reading carefully the a grapes book from Jancis Robinson, which is fantastic and is very technical. And there are different histories about that, but which is true is that uh, the first um, identification of the Tempranillo grape, it was in the 15th century. Apparently, uh, the Tempranillo is supposed to be grown in Navarra and La Rioja and spread rapidly from there. For example, if we think about Vega Sicilia, they identify eight different Tempranillos or different clones within the same area in, in Ribera del Duero or Roda in Rioja has a project with 500 different morphotypes. So we can find a lot of diversity within the Tempranillo and with different personalities as well, not only because of the soils and the climates, in the same place. And traditionally, the Tempranillo has been cultivated in Basso, Basso or Bash, Bush vine. Uh, but you can also, it can also be good in a training system. So in terms of when we go to a glass of wine or for a tasting, no, how which are the, the, um, the most important things that makes a good identification of the Tempranillo. Because normally, sometimes I was reading also about an article about uh, with Sarah Jane Evans, which is uh, uh, another master of wine and a beautiful writer and a person which is in love of Spain. And she always said that uh, when it comes to a blind tasting, sometimes it's difficult to uh, make the a straight identification of Tempranillo. 
uh, it's not the same that having a Cabernet Sauvignon or a Syrah that yeah. normally there are something that put you straight into that. Uh, so Tempranillo have multiple phases that sometimes uh, can be a little bit tricky. But we are going to try to finish this complexity today. Um, so when we go to color, normally it has a ruby color. It's a thick skin uh, berry, um, which normally gives you a lot of uh, intensity. Maybe doesn't have the depth of Cabernet Sauvignon or Syrah or sometimes Merlot, but always is going to have a ruby color. Normally with uh, low yields, it's going to be more intense. With high yields, so when we go into a young wine, it's going to be ruby with less depth. Um, we can find a big variation of aromatics with black cherry, red fruit plum. Um, in high altitude, we can find forest fruit with red and black fruit. Uh, sometimes we can find some leafy notes or it's also giving us, sometimes we can find garlic, which is like rosemary, lavender, herbs. Uh, I always find, in general, licorice. Uh, licorice. Yeah, and coffee, mm -hmm. uh, because the variety has an affinity to oak. That means that it aged very beautifully uh, with the oak. We can find sweet spices and touch of coffee uh, with a little bit of age. Uh, when the wine um, becomes a little bit older, we can find leather, some meaty character, tobacco leaves. And in general, we are going to find moderate to low acidity. Of course, we can find examples of very high acidity, but it's unusual. It's going to be fresh, but when you go to compare with other varieties, it's going to be moderate to low. It has the affinity to oak, it has aging potential. We can find beautiful examples of young wines, but we are going to find beautiful reservas, crianzas, or grand reservas, which are wines with at least four, five years, and we can find these beautiful Riojas from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which are uh, amazing. Mm -hmm. We'll have to taste them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it reflects the terroir and is a variety which is capable to adapt to a range of uh, terroirs and soils and climates. Which is true is that normally the variety is going to show up more complexity and more finesse when we go to cooler or moderate climates. Like is like can be a uh, Rioja or um, or Ribera del Duero, especially, because Ribera del Duero is a cooler climate than Rioja. Even sometimes we can think the opposite because Rioja is in a northern sea, northern spot in Spain, but Rioja is located between the river and the mountains, and it has lower altitude than Ribera del Duero. So it's parts of Rioja has Mediterranean climate. Mm. So for, for have a, an idea. And is a variety that is uh, very good for blending. Um, stylistically, likes the blending. Like if we think in Rioja, the traditional Riojas has been blended with Garnacha or Marzuelo or um, Graciano. Oh, no. yeah. Even very good with Cabernet. Uh, it's not dominant in the blend as could be a Cabernet Sauvignon or a Syrah. And I think this is why sometimes you can confuse it with other varieties. And I think with this in mind, it's going to give us a lot of arguments in order to find out what is a Tempranillo. This is a map where we can see that the Tempranillo is cultivated all around Spain with different objectives and with different personalities, some of them with very old varieties. Um, but, and those are where you have a, a spot those are the major areas where we can find the most interesting uh, tempranillos around Spain. So let's go for the practical part of the tempranillo. Yes. And we can talk about the most of the areas where, where we can find the tempranillo or the areas that we choose. Of course, we have a limited time uh, of tasting, so we cannot make a massive uh, tasting as we look. Um, so we're going to taste. Uh, temp we were looking between Sevi and I, uh, beautiful examples of 100% uh, 
eh, Tempranillo Grape on the Wine, Avoiding the Blends in Order to Be More Educational This Seminar. So normally, in a way, we will be tasting from cooler climates to warm, warm climates, but I order the, this tasting thinking from more simple wine to more complex and aged wine. So this is why we are going to follow this order, okay? But for all of you that you have the wines at home, after that you can play and sweep around and try to find what are the difference between them. So first of all, we are going to La Mancha. Sorry, La Mancha. Just, to, just to mention that for our audience. So if they have a question, if you guys have a question, you can, uh, you can type on the chat uh, section or you can um, ask on the Q&A section. So any question you have, if you ask, I will be uh, try to ask down with Jenna. So just just letting you know about that. Sorry, Almudena. No, no, perfect. So we are going to La Mancha. La Mancha is this big orange spot that we can see in the map. Uh, La Mancha is the biggest area of production in the world, which sometimes I think some of the Spanish people sometimes get a little bit worried about that, but I'm very proud of having the biggest area because also in Spain we have the smallest areas of production. <laughs> Like they can be even 20 or 30 hectares. Oh. Um, La, La Mancha is very interesting. It has uh, 500,000 uh, hectares. Half of them is Irene, which is the white variety and is the first variety planted in the world. And the second is Tempranillo. And uh, after that, we can find all of the varieties of the world. They have a lot of international varieties planted as well. La Mancha is very big, so we can find a lot of diversity within the, the, the appellation. Because, as I told you, La Mancha is a plateau which is flat in the uh, central part and is surrounded by mountains. So we can find high elevation tempranillos or other varieties, particularly in the borders, where we can find 900, 1000 meters altitude. So this is going to be very, very interesting. And even in the flat part, we are going to find seven, between 700 and 800 meters altitude, as is the case of the wine that we are going to taste now. And also, La Mancha is so big that I cannot make a resume here, or we cannot suppose that everything is the same. We will need a, another seminar only to talk about this, because there are, after we are, I'm talking to you about the Castilla-La Mancha as a big appellation, but we are going to fight find a small dios within it, like Ucles or other, other ones, that which of them are going to be very, very different. But which is true is that we can find a lot of uh, Tempranillo, normally planted in bush or in bush vines, in Basso, which we call it in Spain. And we are going to find as well a lot of old uh, Tempranillo planted on the, with, with no irrigation. In this case, uh, we are, this is a little map that I wanted to put you just to simplify and to see the climates where we are going to speak and where is uh, uh, number one, which is La Mancha, is continental. Uh, so, uh, oh, yes, as I told you, um, we can find a lot of uh, Spanish varieties and as well international varieties. In the case of uh, the wine that we choose is 1,605. Uh, 1, <laughs> 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 it's made uh, in bodegas mano a mano. Um, the translation it will be hand by hand. And they have a beautiful uh, vineyard, uh, very big, I don't remember now, I think it's around 100 hectares that belongs to the winery. Wow. The, the full, the full plot is uh, between 20 and 50 years uh, vines. Um, well, 50 years old vines. And in this case, it's a young wine with a short period of aging. Around three months of aging in, oh, just a brief uh, age, just to give a touch of complexity uh, and a little bit of perfume. I think what we can find in La Mancha, uh, we are speaking that we have this 
sky elevation that is going to give us this continental climate, but which is true, is in the um, south part of Spain, on, in the mid, if we cut Spain with a line crossing around Madrid, is in the bottom part of Madrid, in the southern part, so we are going to find higher temperatures. It's a warmer climate compared with Castilla y León, which is in the northern part. So we are going to find higher temperatures and this is going to give a different uh, profile to the wine. Also in La Mancha we are going to find so many different types of soils. In this case we can find clay underneath and some sandy on top. So basically I will I will tell you, uh, I think for me the wines in La Mancha or the Tempranillo in La Mancha always have this uh, feeling of warmth. You can find um, ripe fruit, ripe black fruit, more plums, and, and also for me, uh, I always find a little bit of black olive. Okay. Or, for me, this is like a little clue. But you can see that it has this intensity and this uh, powerful and ripe aromas, which make the wine very, um, very easy to drink or and is always inviting you to taste. We choose this wine as well because it's a relatively uh, naked wine in terms of aging uh, or oak. It's only a small, small three, three months in oak, so it's not impacting too much, but we can see the variety very clean. So it's round on the palate, we are going to find Normally grainy, tannins, you, it's a, the Tempranillo variety is rich in tannins, but because the, the acidity is moderate to low, the filling is going to be grainy, like, but very fine. Sometimes, um, and normally in the front to mid palate, and you are going to have this uh, fruit core, in this case, riper because of the climate. It's showing the typicity of La Mancha. Mm -hmm. I think we go through, uh, so we have time a little bit to compare. Um, the second wine uh, that we have here is Elias Mora. Elias Mora is coming from one of the most beautiful deals in Spain, which is Toro. And I'm very proud of Toro because I born in Zamora and my family is from this. No, it's, it's not from Toro, but it's very close to Toro. And I was working for 12 years in a very, very small deal just in the border of Toro. Um, and nowadays I'm still also working there uh, and I think it's a great, great area of production. In Toro we can find so many old vines. In Toro we are going to change, um, we go to the map again, sorry. Uh, we change from Castilla-La Mancha to Castilla-León. And we can compare here because they are relatively warm climate within the plateau. Different plateau, we go to the northern part, but Toro is the warmest uh, DO producing Tempranillo in Castilla y León. It's part of the Duero River uh, area. The Duero, the Duero is a river that burns on top of Madrid, in a way, in the mountains, and go all the way to the west into Portugal. And it's giving us the great, great, great uh, areas of production as Ribera del Duero, Rueda, Toro. In this case, there are small ones uh, north and south of the Duero River, finishing in Las Ribes del Duero and getting into port, into the Douro in Portugal. Um, so, uh, Toro is the last DO, it's not the last, the last big one before getting into Portugal. In here, again, we are going to share some uh, things in common with La Mancha, like is the soil. Normally in Toro, we are going to find a lot of clay soil, very rich in iron. And also we are going to have a lot of sandy and sometimes river stones, because Toro is very close to the uh, Duero River uh, side. Um, because it's the flattened part of the plateau, but we are going to have here as well 700 meters of altitude. We have cool winters, but long summers compared with Ribera del Duero or other northern areas. Um, here, the Tempranillo is called 
Tinta de Toro. Tinta de Toro, the translation, it will be like the... Uh, how, how can I do the good translation? So tinta is like ink or inky. When, when you call it like this, tinta means like a little bit inky. And toro is a bull. So it, it will be like, uh, but this will be the close or translation. But basically here is like the tempranillo, which is very inky from the toro area. Basically is what it means. And what happened that the tempranillo and the clone adapt differently to this uh, area of production. And this is why we can find this different name. If we look to the grape, it's slightly bigger than in Ribera del Duero, for example, and the skin is thicker. Uh, and also the skin has higher content in anthocyanins, which are the uh, compound that give you the color, particularly the blue color. For example, if you crush a grape into your fingers, and you look to the color, it's going to be very blue compared with, for example, in Rivera del Duero, which is going to be more ruby and red. Uh, this is, that is, a, different, uh, is a different clone uh, of Tempranillo, maybe that. It's a different clone because it has been adapted to the climate and to the soils. Okay, yes, yes. And we have warmer temperatures, richer in clay with a lot of iron and warmer uh, and warmer temperatures during the summer. And also, normally, the skin has a higher concentration on tannins and the texture of the tannins are different. Normally, it's slightly more rustic or present or firm. Uh, rustic sometimes could be a negative uh, compound attached to it, but uh, without the negative compound, I just want uh, to explain that you are going to find more texture on your palate with a toro, or at least the traditional toros. Um, in toro, we are going, uh, it's a very small area of production. If you see the, the surfaces uh, less than 6,000 hectares. If we think uh, with an international uh, point of view, if we think about uh, Bordeaux, we can find 120,000 hectares. Rioja is more or less half, 60,000. Mm. Rivera del Duero, a little bit more than 20,000 hectares, and Toro, less than 6,000. Yeah, it's a small area. Yeah, and also because we can find a lot of sandy soils, we are going to find a lot of old vines, Prefiloxera vineyards. They, we can find around 20% of the surface planted uh, with vineyards more than 100 years old already. Nice. It's very unique and <laughs> unusual. Also, we can find a part of the Tempranillo or Tinta de Toro, a bit of Garnacha and a bit of Malvasia and a small spots of Verdejo because the proximity with Rueda. So, if we go to the... Um, uh, if we, this is a resume of all of the things that I was telling you. Toro is a very unique place where we can find very big producers or very icon international or global producers as is Vega Sicilia or the group LVMH uh, or Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy with, with the Numantia winery. Or even we can find people like Michel Roland making some of the wines there. Um, and Toro has a big, big tradition producing high quality wines. If we look a little, this is just a, a history, little history, if we yes. look to the if we look to the in the old past when the in Castilla y León used to leave the king in the 15th 16th century so normally Toro was the area that was producing wine for the for the king oh, and okay. the climate is very nice and the variety is very good that produce wine with lot of color and good alcohol when the alcohol was part of the food of the day or the energy and calories of the day. Um, normally it was wines with a bigger palate and very opulent on the, on the mouth. So they had a big recognition with quality. Because Rivera del Duero is very cool and it was very complicated to produce wines, Rivera del Duero used to produce claret or rosé wines, a blend of um, tempranillo with white varieties and all of this is because the, the climate there in Rivera del Duero was horrible and it's 
and it is now <laughs> very complicated. And Toro is uh, slightly milder and gives you the opportunity to produce these powerful wines. But and if you work beautifully and with care, uh, the viticulture you can find very refined wines. What happened in Toro? That um, maybe because the climate is slightly warmer, maybe the wines are going to be less complex in terms of aromas, or sometimes people could be a little bit more, less elegant or less finesse, just because, but this is normally what happens in warmer climates around the world. But the wines has a lot of aging potential and uh, produce very, very high quality wines that last for long, which I think uh, this speak about the greatest areas in the world when the wine is able to age. With that, let's try a little bit of the Lias Mora. Yeah. In this case, we choose, it's not a complex wine for aging because uh, normally they, uh, they have a lot of oak and we wanted to show more the powerful and the variety with the characteristic. In this case, it's less than 12 months aging in oak and I think you, can, you are going to see that it's very fruity and, and basically the fruit profile, which is for me more interesting. In this case, it's 30, 35 year old vines. Uh, the soil is a mixture between river stones and clay because the proximity to the Duero River. Um, and you have a little bit of chemical or analysis for the people that wants to know a little bit more. So basically, if we look to the color, it, it, we can find a little bit of blue hint, a little bit more purple. Yeah, actually. We compare it with the other wines. And for me, Toro is always an opulent and rich wine, which um, a very upfront wine, uh, where you have a lot of fruit, is talking directly to you, and always uh, invite you to drink a lot. Uh, for me, is a is a beautiful wine. I always say that for barbecue time because it's very rich in aromas, very rich in flavors, and normally everyone loves it. And in barbecue, for barbecue moment, you have a lot of different flavors and it's going to match perfectly. Also, I like it a lot now in autumn because the, the alcohol normally gives you a, a little bit more warm and it's very good as well with chickpeas or beans, with the stews, goes very well. A very good idea, actually. Very nice idea. It's very autumn wine. So you can see, and for me, Toro is a lot of licorice and plums. It's more in the ripe black fruit side. Yeah, exactly. It's, the fish profile is like very, very um, vibrant and ripe. Yeah. That's... Exactly. And you can feel the warmth of the fruit and also the alcohol very well balanced with the rest of the components. And I think it's a very beautiful wine for enjoying with... I like this. Yeah. Very, very nice. So let's keep going. So now, as the bigger houses producers, um, also myself, normally we think that in the cooler climates or in the extreme climates is where the variety is going to show more finesse and more complexity. And we go through, uh, or we go to Rivera del Duero a little bit more east from Toro, between Rivera del Duero and Toro, there will be around 100 kilometers, less than one hour driving, but it's completely different uh, area. So Rivera del Duero is a very continental stream climate, very cool winters, very long uh, uh, winters as well, uh, more or less we have this sentence in Spanish, I'm going to translate so it doesn't sound the same, but normally we said that until the 40th of May, don't take out your coach. So that's meaning that have your coat close to you until the middle of June. Nice rule. <laughs> just, just to be safe. Yeah. By the way, it's a, it's a very heavy bottle. I was just... Uh... Yeah, it's too heavy. Yeah. <laughs> the very nice producers, but um, they need to think a little bit in the environmentally they need yeah. to be a little bit more environmentally. Yeah, I've been holding the bottles. It's like really so heavy, but yeah, um, yeah, very heavy. Yeah. <laughs> it's because it's a 
big producer and wants to show up a little yes. bit with yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, in Rivera del Duero, we are going to, you can see there, is more or less on top of Madrid. It goes through three different provinces and we have high elevations. We have between 1,100 meters altitude uh, down to 850. So we have a big uh, difference, a big variation compared with Toro. So everything is going to have more impact. Um, also, it's an area where all the soils are very rich in calcareous rock or calcareous soil, as we can find in Champagne or in Burgundy. This soil is also is going to give a lot of personality to the variety and maybe more um, muscular and a lot of tension in the in the palate. And because of this climate, we are going to preserve a little bit more of the acidity. Because all of the area is uh, crossed by the Duero River, we are going to find a big diversity of um, soils. Also area in the valley, we are going to cut the bottom part of the valley with more deposits and deeper soils. We are going to have slopes with a lower depth of soil and more rich in calcareous rock. And we are going to have the top part of the valley with different altitudes, different depths of soil and more diversity depending on the erosion. So we have the Duero River in the middle and we have a small, um, how do you call it, the small rivers that go to a big river? Um, suddenly I forgot the word. But a small valleys of a small rivers that go in into the main okay. one, the Duero River. Um, so we are going to find a lot of diversity of uh, phases of the Tempranillo, different fruit profiles, different fruit flavors, different acidity and different texture of the tannins. It's an area where you can get as crazy as you want looking for different wines. And it's also sometimes difficult to compare one with the other because each producer has the vineyards in a different place, is looking for different things and producing their own vision of Rivera del Duero. Which is true, this Rivera del Duero normally has a more modern style in the wine making and they are using normally a lot of new oak, French new oak. So sometimes we are going to find wines with a lot of oak in the aromatics and also in the palate. Sometimes, um, sometimes overpowering the variety, but depending on the styles and whatever you want or you like more, everything is fine because each of us are different. In this case, Pago de los Capellanes is more or less in the middle of Rivera del Duero. Oh, the, the major variety in Rivera del Duero is Tempranillo, which accounts for 98% of the total plantation. Yeah, yeah. After that, we can find the small spots of Cabernet Sauvignon, a bit of Merlot, a bit of Malbec, but very rare and unusual. In the past, uh, we used to find a lot of Garnacha. That so, probably will come in the future because Garnacha is uh, later ripening variety, preserves a lot of acidity and is going to be very good to blend with the Tempranillo. Yeah, so can we say then uh, we would expect to see more 100% Tempranillos in Ribera del Duero? Yes. Instead, yes. Like, with the blending of the others. So it's more like generally then we will see a hundred percent in the street. Yeah. Okay. This is why that when you want to, if you are a student or you want to become an expert on Tempranillo, uh, maybe Rivera del Duero is the place to begin with. Uh, because in Rioja, Rioja has changed a lot. In the past used to be blended. Nowadays we can find more uh, monovarietal wines but you need to know, to get to know your producer in order to know what is uh, the philosophy in each of the wineries. In Rivera del Duero, the Tempranillo is called Tinto Fino. Like, uh, Fino is like finesse. So it's the red variety with elegance and finesse. It will be more or less the translation. Uh, and also, as I told you, we can find a big diversity of soils and um, climates which are going to give us a lot of diversity. In the case of Pago de los Capellanes, they are in the middle of the Ribera del Duero. They are located in an area where uh, you can find more clay, 
uh, as well. They are using 30 years old vines. Also, in Ribera del Duero, even you have clay on top, you are going to have calcareous rock uh, in the mother rock. So you are going to have calcareous all the time uh, with a higher content or less content. Um, there is a very um, um, uh, is a wine, very ambitious wine, Pago de los Capellanes. So we are going to find this concentration, this richness, and a long maceration process of 30 days and 12 months of aging in oak. And they used to, normally they use 300 liters, uh, liter French oak barrels for the wine. If we see, if we look to the color, we can find this beautiful ruby, in very intense. Yeah. A bit, a bit, well, a ruby, ruby plus, I mean, very, very bright. We are going to find very complex fruit aromas. For me, in this case, the Tempranillo is showing more like cherry fruit, um, black cherry or cherry, and also forest fruit. Of course, it's blended with the sweet spices and touch of a smoke, um, a little bit of tobacco. Yeah, but I say the oak is not really overpowering. It is well integrated. What do you think about it? It is it's really very well uh, balanced. Yeah, yeah. Um, very high quality winery, and they are producing a very elegant fine wine. Mm. with a long aging process, or long, 12 months in oak, but very well integrated. And I think this is part of oh, the reason that they are using the 300 liter uh, barrels, which are helping to um, decrease the amount of oak into the wine. I think it's beautiful because you, can, you have a lot of primary fruit. You can find the secondary aromas coming from the oak, but very well integrated in a very well elegance. And I think we start to have as well some tertiary aromas with touch of leather, touch of tobacco, and I think uh, it has a lot of aging potential, this wine. Also, we need to think up, we need to say that this is one of the most complicated vintages of the last decade, because 2017, uh, which is the wine, we had a very strong frost in Rivera del Duero that decreased the total production uh, in 60%. So more than a half of the production of a normal year, and also it was a very warm summer. So I think uh, they uh, make a great, great uh, job at the winery and with the vineyards because the wine is very refined and very nice. Yeah, it is. It is lovely. Yeah. We also have a question. Uh, sorry. Um, what's the vintage of this wine? So it's 2017. 17. Yeah. Oh yes. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I didn't put it into the. Oh. <laughs> so I think it's a beautiful wine. We can see the dip, of course, is a higher level than the previous wines in terms of uh, money, but also in terms of concentration and complexity. Yeah, but more think, complex. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can see also the difference between the climates as well, and it's a. Um, it's an extra level of complexity due to the area of production. Yeah, I'm also comparing, uh, like on the nose at least, with the previous wine. So it is so obvious to see the, the differences um, just even at the nose, you know. Uh, yeah. The big profile is totally different. You yeah. can see which climates are warmer and which are cooler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it is amazing to see actually, you know, it's in your glass. It is, it is. Um, and also it will look to the acidity on your palate and also the, the, the alcohol. Oh, oh. In 2017 is not going to help us to compare because mm -hmm. uh, 2018, for example, which is the Elias Mora, it was a cooler vintage and 17 it was a warm vintage. So suddenly we have all the same alcohol coming from different areas. But I think the fruit profile is uh, speaking and clarifying totally the difference between the others. And also, if you look to the texture of the tannins in the two previous wines, you know, uh, we can find more uh, powdery and softer tannins. When we go into Rivera del Duero, they are more firm and more grainy or chalky mm -hmm. tannins. 
with a different texture on your palate. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, talking about the calcareous soil in the area. And if we go to the last wine, uh, Glorioso Reserva, is a beautiful wine coming from the northern part of Rioja, from Rioja a La Besa. Um, and in this case is Reserva, is uh, the last wine in our tasting. It's also 100% Tempranillo from, from Rioja, in this case is not blended. Um, Rioja, as I told you before, is like half of Bordeaux area. We can find basically or majority uh, Tempranillo grape planted. More or less nowadays it will be 60% Tempranillo, 40% uh, Grenache or Garnacha, uh, which normally is more in the southern, southern uh, east part of Rioja, where the climate is more Mediterranean. Yeah. And a question, um, if, if you mind. Uh, so in Rioja, we see much more writing the aging in the American oak barrels than the French. Um, is that true? Can you can we see more American oaks uh, for aging in Rioja comparing the other regions, I think. Uh, so traditionally, yes. Nowadays, there are so many different samples, but if we want some rules to follow. Normally the traditional Riojas were uh, aged for long period and normally traditionally in American oak. Yeah, thank you, thank you Madame. And also one more question, it is the name Rioja, is it coming from the river actually, Oja, Rioja? There is no clear the, yeah. the origin of the name, but one of the hypotheses, um, hypotheses, yeah, uh, is that the name of Rioja is coming from Rio Oja. Okay, yeah, Rio. There are other, um, other hypotheses uh, because um, there are a word in, in Basque language is, is like Rioja or something similar that means uh, stone, big stones and rocas and mountains made with uh, rocks. And maybe yeah. we think in Sierra Cantabria, maybe there are another... Yeah. In, in English-speaking countries as well, we hear a lot more, the pronunciation would be more like Rioja. But I think, um, uh, would you prefer it or does it matter how to pronounce it? Uh, what's your opinion on the, the pronunciation of the... I, I, I'm not able to... <laughs> <laughs> to make a judgment about pronunciation because I have very strong Spanish accent. So I can understand totally that the sound ha, which is very Spanish, is complicated to pronounce in different languages. And yes, normally when I heard the word Rioja uh, in England, uh, I used to listen ka, Rioja, Rioja. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for me, I, I think it's just beautiful the, um, it's just beautiful how we pronounce the different names between or with the different accents around the world. I used to be very shy about that and worry about my accent, but nowadays I accept it. So I accept <laughs> any type of accent while we can understand each other. Of course. So I love Rioja. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, if we go into Rioja, uh, but if you want to learn, it's just to make you, the sound is coming from your uh, trout. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a nice tip actually. Yeah. So, Rioja is very diverse as well because uh, also it's going to be impacted by the Rio Ebro which is crossing and also there are so many little rivers like the Rio Oja that are going into the subsidiary rivers, is the word, no? <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly it came to me. So I know, are, yeah, it kind of disappears. At half <laughs> there are six, seven, uh, there are at least seven uh, subsidiary rivers that go in, into the main river, which is the Ebro. So all of this is going to be a big, big uh, diversity in the orography of the area, giving it up to seven different subzones in the area. 
the, the zones or sub-zones that are um, communicated are three, the main ones, which is oriental, which is more Mediterranean, uh, with more garnacha. Uh, as I told you, it will be 60% of the variety Tempranillo and 40 garnacha. A few years ago, a few decades, it was opposite. It was more garnacha than Tempranillo. It happened similar to Bordeaux, that it used to be more Cabernet and less Merlot, and nowadays there are more Merlot and less Cabernet. <laughs> These stylistically things that happen in the, in the appellations. And nowadays there are more Tempranillo. And after that, there are two other areas, which is Rioja Alta in the northern northwest and Rioja Alavesa, which is in the northern part. Also, there are a diversity of politically uh, areas because there are different provinces that belong to different um, communities. But basically, these subzones are talking about different climates and different areas of production. Um, so, Tempranillo and Rioja is altogether complicated for a student or to learn about Tempranillo because this diversity is giving us a lot of styles and uh, things to talk in Rioja. But we, this is why we choose one of the coolest climate, just to see the complexity, one reserva to see the aging potential of the Tempranillo. And a it's a modern style with a touch of classic style, just to see a little bit of what is, uh, or what is in our brains or in our DNA about Rioja. Um, so some tips uh, in Rioja, traditionally the wine was blended. Nowadays there are, we can find more commonly 100% Tempranillo wines. Um, normally the way of classification the Rioja has, as well as Rivera, but traditionally in Rioja has been about the aging in oak, the time that the wines is spent in oak. And nowadays the area has moved a little bit more to French oak, but they use, traditionally, use more American oak. Uh, and nowadays, there are a new classification, if you want to know more about that, that they are doing classification about uh, sing, uh, viñedos singulares, okay. which are single viñas that are, uh, that makes single individual wines, only from one viña, you cannot blend these single vineyards together, always individual, to speak about the greatness of the terroir of uh, Rioja. Now they also implant or they launch the classification of village. So each uh, the one area, the vineyards need to be on the, um, on the political area of the village. Mm -hmm. And also subzones can be appear on the uh, labels since uh, 2017, but the majority of the wines are going to be aged for one or two years. So from now to the future, we are going to see more detail in our labels. And all of this new classification is going to cross straight with the classic classification of Crianza or Reserva. So okay, and will they, will they be called as well DOCA or will they start from the DOC kind of? No, DOCA. Always be because yeah. they have the, the classification on that, but uh, you can find a reserva, a wine, a wine with a reserva level that has been made in La Guardia, in the case of uh, Glorioso, in Rioja Alavesa. So it's a wine that is, it has 100% DNA from Rioja Alavesa and from La Guardia. So every time that you read these words in the label means that that is coming from this specific point or, or this specific place of Rioja. So it's going to be free for the wineries if they want to use it or not. Okay. Let's go to the wine. In yeah. this case, we are going into the Reserva label, one of the beautiful styles that uh, put Rioja all around the world because of the aging potential and the beautiful wines that you can find there. If Tempranillo has a house in the world or has a representation or a place where it likes to be and is going to show greatness and complexity is here in Rioja and especially in Rioja Arabesa because it's a cool climate, 
moderate cool, moderate to cool, I mean, with relatively high elevations, six to 700 uh, meters altitude, and this climate and these soils, which are going to be rich in clay, and as well, we are going to find some spots of calcareous soil, are going to show this greatness of the Tempranillo variety. In this case, we choose a reservoir level to show the affinity to oak or the variety, and as well, the potential of aging. We are going to find in Rioja La Besa, higher uh, concentration of color, press, pressure acidity, and if we think about Rioja, the grape normally is slightly bigger than we can find in Rivera del Duero. This is why we are going to find a slightly less concentration and the tannins are going to be softer and more gentle on the palate than in Rivera del Duero. In um, this case, I, sorry, sorry, uh, the uh, wine has been aged for 722 days, is 70% in French, 30% in American, and it was bottled in June 18. Oh, yeah, the year that I passed. So it's almost uh, two years something in the bottle already. So we are going to, or the idea is to find primary aromas about the fruit, secondary aromas remind us the oak, and tertiary aromas or starting tertiary aromas like leather or meaty character or some tobacco leaves all together blended in this wine. We have a question here. Um, so the question is, what is exactly DOCA? So if you can uh, maybe answer the differences between uh, DOC and DOCA. Uh, so basically, DOCA is denominación de origen calificada. It's like an extra level of a DO. It's a this extra level is like um, I'm, it's more like it's an extra level of classification. You need to be uh, producing, you, have, you need to have a history of being producing high quality wines uh, with good level of uh, quality in the majority of the area and as well some reputation of your wines and as well basically is more strict uh, laws in order to get it. So the DO is um, has more rules and more controls around the production of the wine. Thank you. And there are only, I think, two regions in Spain with the T DOCA, uh, isn't it? Riorat and Rioja. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Almudena. So if we go to the wine, we can see that we have, even being reserva, we have a very bright, intense, uh, young color. We are going to find, in a very elegant way, the three uh, families of aromas. Because we are in a cooler climate as well, we are going to find also more strawberry than black fruit. It's, it's going to be a combination between red and black fruit. And also beautiful uh, oak aromas in, in a way of perfumeness. Um, and also this touch of the tertiary aromas of the aging of the wine. On the palate, the wine is going to be very savory and rich in flavor, very elegant, very fine acidity, very fine tannins. Yeah. The, you, can, you are going to see the present, that you are going to feel the present of the tannins, but very soft and smooth. One, because it's Rioja, second, because it's a wine with more aging, where all the characteristics of the wine are softening down or the tannins are less firm and a little bit more relaxed. Yeah, it is very velvety. Yeah, very velvety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's very rich and very nice. Um, rich in terms of uh, no intensity, in elegance of all the components of the wine, very well balanced. And also the length is very long and the persistence mm -hmm. on the palate is going to last uh, for a long time. And it's 2015, so it's five year old wine already. We see that the um, Tempranillo has a lot of potential all around. <laughs> Basically, Tempranillo is a great variety, uh, but we need to plant it only in the best places to find out these uh, great examples. And I hope you enjoy and learn a lot and 
open up to more questions if you want or any doubts that you you may have yeah that was that was just so amazing to see you know the differences the same variety same great variety but seeing the differences how it can be changed um you know from region to region uh it, it was very very interesting and um, yeah it, it is so uh nice to see it just on your glass uh, what's the effect of the climate and different soil different uh parts in spain so that was lovely uh but if it, yeah, as you mentioned more questions uh please uh, you can ask any kind of questions and uh if not uh thank you so much our Modena. that was uh yeah really really good we have comments here coming saying it was very nice very impor informative and yeah that was very interesting tasting um, thank you very much i'm enjoying a lot so hopefully everyone <laughs> is the same yeah and ho hope soon we can uh start traveling so we can come to spain and taste those wines. hopefully uh you know in the region and hopefully visit you uh, so that that would be so nice um so looking forward to this day hopefully to come soon ah uh, yes yeah. me too <laughs> you are more than welcome and i would love to go to visit you as well i used to travel a lot and now i didn't travel since march so yeah. i'm feeling like a grandmother at home like <laughs> Yeah, all, all same, yeah, but yeah, come to Ireland, um, we, we have beautiful landscape, we don't, we don't produce wine here, but uh, we have a lot to show, um, different uh, parts in Ireland, different beauties, so we hope we love it here, yeah, thank you so much, and thank you very much, Sebi, bye for now.